This is something like uh, your definition of, of teaching. It's not sit down, do as you're told, shut up, listen to me. Um, teaching um, is all about carefully supporting people, carefully supporting people. That sounds, you know, very obvious. But teaching, um, in, in my book, as it were, is about supporting people um, on a journey of discovery, very much um, informed by early years uh, terminology there. Nurturing people's curiosity, young children's curiosity. Learning, I don't mean just being able to read, write, um, and do sums, um, but I mean uh, fostering that uh, desire to be curious, that desire to learn. W.B. Yeats, the great Irish poet, and I'm no English specialist, but I do know that he said education is not about filling a pail, that's what they call buckets in, their, in uh, his generation. It's not about filling buckets, but it's about lighting fires. Uh, lighting fires. And so learning and teaching together uh, are all about setting children off um, on a pathway uh, of discovery that hopefully will become lifelong learning. An education, well, again, many definitions. To me, as a person, my view of education, the purpose of it is to help each and every one of us, each and every unique child, to realise their fullest potential, to become the human being that they were born to be. And that is about igniting curiosity, but it's about giving them every possible opportunity uh, to shine and to feel good about what they can do and the choices that they can make um, out in the big wide world. So, oh no, do we have to talk about love? Well, yes, I think we do, not least because David Halpin in 2009, um, uh, he wrote uh, a paper which profoundly influenced me um, when I started teaching here. I'd read a few journal articles, but they were a bit heavy. They sent me to sleep, I have to say, some of them. I had long words in, and they weren't very well line-spaced. But I came across David Halpin's article, which he called Pedagogy and Romantic Love. Pedagogy and Romantic Love. And in that, he says, well, you can read it there, despite the fact that many educators, many teachers talk about loving their profession, loving what they do, loving children, loving working with children, loving working with their colleagues. I was going to get you to ask, I was going to get somebody to keep counting how many times I said love, actually. So if you've counted already, keep a tally. Tell me at the end. Um, we don't hear much in the academic uh, sphere about the word love in teacher training, um, in, in working in an education setting, uh, people have veered away from it. Now, there are 101 different reasons for that. Um, let me just say, possibly because it's misunderstood, I'd like to think that um, people could uh, grab a hold of it and really start to um, let it inform um, their view of teaching and working um, with children and young people. But it's one of those words that's difficult to define, perhaps it might have different connotations when working with children. Let's just leave it to one side. It's a bit woolly and fluffy. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it. But he wrote this um, uh, journal article, Pedagogy and Romantic Love. And uh, it opened my eyes, actually. And uh, I thought, wow, not only do, is there, are there interesting things in journals, uh, to read once you actually find it. Primo's good at helping you, isn't it? Um, but once you find one um, and it really grabs your attention, it can lead you off in all sorts of directions. And this one um, did. Um, because uh, it, I think um, uh, that it, it resonated, if you like, with something deep down inside me. And that was that um, Loving people, loving things, all right, um, is an, in an, an innate quality and in in an innate part of being a human being. Um, and so why should we sideline it? So why should we not talk about it? Why should we not let it inform um, our lives and our professions and our points of view? As an early years person, um, I know, um, and as a father too, 
Um, I know that young children come into the world, as Sue Goodhart said in this fantastic book, uh, a great read, 2009, Why Love Matters. Um, uh, the, there are copies of it in the library. Um, and um, she says, each, each little human organism is born a, uh, a vibrating, pulsating symphony. Aren't those words wonderful? Um, the point being that actually even before uh, a young child, uh, a young human being uh, enters the world, they're already um, curious. They're hearing their mother's uh, voice. They're hearing heartbeats. Uh, they're sensitive to sound. They're sensitive uh, to touch and pressure and so on. They're primed, um, ready to seek out um, other people. And um, obviously when they come into the world, uh, that takes on a whole new connotation because they can see, um, uh, they can hear, they can move around and they can begin to explore um, as well. So it's part of being a human. And we see um, this very much again, um, thinking about early years. Um, after uh, a birth, uh, there's the critical period um, of um, when young um, human beings, young children, young babies make what's called an attachment. If you're not familiar with that term, then you've got a bit of time, you might like to look it up. But it's um, something that uh, uh, somebody called John Bowlby um, did a lot of research on, and he brought the terminology um, out um, into uh, uh, parlance, if you like, common um, everyday um, medical, particularly understanding uh, of relationships and psychology and so on and so forth. And uh, he talked about uh, attachment theory and about how it was crucial uh, that um, young children began right from birth um, to have an emotional bond and the primary carer, generally speaking the mother, but not necessarily always, um, forms that attachment um, that is going to be lifelong and take, um, uh, take uh, the, the child um, into a strong um, and healthy relationship, not just with the mother, but other members uh, of the family, a wider growing social circle, and ultimately a good healthy relationship with themselves as well, and I'll come on to that um, later on. So relationships are really important. I think relationships, um, we seek relationships, we need, we want relationships. Um, and here's a little video clip. Um, anybody seen Angela's Ashes here? Angela's Ashes, yeah, thanks, um, Keith. Here's a very little um, uh, clip, um, same generation, don't worry. Um, here's a little clip from Angela's Ashes where actually there's some teaching going on um, but actually there's no relationship. There's no relationship between the teacher um, and uh, the little lad here. He gets himself into all sorts of trouble and has to go and see the head teacher. But actually, if you uh, listen carefully, the Irish accent's a little bit difficult to understand and uh, the, vo the, the volume's not all that good. Um, sorry, the sound quality isn't all that good. But hopefully, uh, you'll get the drift here. It's quite funny too. So let's stop listening to me for a minute and let's go back in time um, to Angela's Ashkiss. The name of my competition is Title McCord. The title. The title of my composition is Jesus and the Weather. What? Jesus and the Weather Song. All right. Read it. I don't think Jesus, who is our Lord, would have liked the weather in Limerick, because it's always raining, and the Shannon keeps the whole city down. My father says the Shannon is a killer river, because it killed my two brothers. When you look at pictures of Jesus, he's always wandering around ancient Israel in a sheep. It never rains there, and you never hear of anyone coughing, or getting a consumption, or anything like that. And no one has a job there, because all they do is stand around, eat manna, shake their fists, and go to crucifixions. Anytime Jesus got hungry, all he had to do was to walk up the road to a fig tree or an orange tree and have his fill. Or if he wanted a pint, he could wave his hand over a big glass, and there was the pint. Or he could visit Mary Magdalene and her sister Martha, and they gave him his dinner, no questions asked. 
So it's good to change Jesus decided to be born Jewish in that nice warm place. Because if he was born in Limerick, he'd catch the consumption and be dead in a month, and there wouldn't be any Catholic church, and we wouldn't have to write compositions about him. At the end. Did you write this composition, McCord? I did so. The miracle worked. I was back in my old class. Start your mind. It's your house of treasure, and no one in the world can interfere with it. Fill your mind with rubbish, and it'll rot to your head. You might be poor, your shoes might be broken, but your mind, your mind is a palace. <laughs> So the mind is a palace, uh, a very traditional, old style form of uh, education, sitting in rows and no disrespect to the Catholic Church for uh, that way of um, uh, bringing up children uh, in that period of time. Um, but there was a lot of um, uh, learn this, learn that, and that's the end actually of uh, the, the story where that little boy um, was... Uh, uh, went off on his own, if you like, went off on his own and actually he had to write something about, he was uh, asked to write about Jesus obviously in the Catholic school uh, and he was asked uh, to, to write something but almost wrote, uh, copy something down um, because he didn't feel any uh, connection uh, with, the, with the teacher um, but ultimately that's what he actually um, uh, produced and uh, the head teacher recognised, he thought he was going in to get into trouble, um, but the head teacher recognised uh, something special there. And then when he came back uh, to the different classroom, uh, he uh, 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 was fulfilled, if you like, um, for, for what he'd done. So, uh, back to love then, what do I mean by love? Well, David Halpin um, said um, uh, that, well, you can read this uh, in front of you, um, he draws very much upon um, uh, the Greek language, and I'm um, no Greek expert uh, by any means, but um, the Greek language has, I'm told, um, uh, once when uh, Steve and I did this, um, Steve knocked up my uh, three words, which are based um, uh, on what I'm talking about here, to four or five, I think. He quickly Googled something and found it on Wikipedia. Um, when I was looking earlier on, I think I found, uh, it, it came up actually there was over 30, but um, that would make this session far too long. So I'm going to uh, just pick on these, um, these three um, that David Halpin particularly um, draws out and related to um, being um, a teacher, being uh, informed by having a love um, for what you're doing um, and a love for working um, with young children. So um, the three words are eros, philia, and uh, agape. And uh, you can read the whole journal article if you want. Very uh, easy to find through primo um, pedagogy and romantic love. Um, the first one, uh, eros, uh, I'm sure you've made a connection uh, with the word erotic, drive, motivation, Okay, here's my uh, small definition, if you like. A heightened desire making human life happier and uh, more meaningful. Um, I'm relating this to education and teaching because um, my experience is that um, good teachers are those that are passionate about what they do, not just passionate about their partner, but passionate about uh, what they do. They have uh, a heightened desire uh, to uh, do a great job um, really well. And um, uh, this uh, little, um, uh, whatever you want to call it here, um, uh, is, is something that, that caught my eye. Um, I, I think it's a, a good reminder of the um, drive and enthusiasm that we see um, young children particularly uh, exhibiting, you know, that, that complete abandonment and carefree, let's go for it um, type of approach. So um, 
Eros, um, as part of love in teaching, uh, is, if you like, what gets us up in the morning, what gets us going, what uh, takes us through those difficult times uh, when, it's, when it's hard going. And you know, having come back from school experience, uh, we all know here that there are hard times in, um, in teaching, but you need that motivation um, uh, to keep going. So, um, Eros um, is one uh, definition. This one um, may be not quite so um, uh, familiar to you, um, but it's what the Greeks used uh, to describe that aspect of love that is more relational, uh, if you like, that is more about community, is more about working um, together for a common uh, purpose. And particularly, it's about um, uh, looking out for others, making sure for others uh, the right thing is done. Not so much for oneself. Um, there's a, a, a reciprocal side uh, to it. You're in a relationship, but you're actually wanting the best for others. So all good teachers uh, want the best um, uh, for their children. Want the best in a school community um, for the people that they're working with. Um, want the very, very best um, for the outside community and society, ultimately. Many people that I interview, and I'm sure you said it um, on your uh, UCAS form, uh, but when I interview uh, students who want to join early childhood studies, why do you, why, why do you want to do this? What, what attracts you to teaching? Um, maybe you've been asked this in an interview question recently. Many, many people say, because I want to make a difference. I want, to make, I want to make a difference. And that contains an element of eros, but it actually contains a bigger element, I think, um, of actually wanting to affect um, other people's lives um, for the better. This one, um, agape, um, uh, is, uh, is a word that actually has quite a lot of theological um, um, connotations. Um, but we won't go down that road um, now, other than you've seen this and you've experienced it and you've done it, whether you realise it or not uh, as teachers, but you've seen it particularly in young children, I'm sure. Uh, this willingness to be sacrificial, to give away, not just see the better, see, other, see make sure other people, uh, things turn out right for other people, as I just mentioned, as in philia, but in terms of um, being prepared to not lay down your life literally, but actually give something quite painful of yourself. We've all had that early mornings, late nights. But actually really being stretched, there's something deep inside um, all good teachers um, and, and uh, all good teaching that actually is, is not just driven and passionate, is not just wanting um, it to turn out well for other people, uh, or that child there, or that community over there, but um, also um, is actually aching uh, to give something away, unconditionally. You come to my class, I'm gonna teach you. There's no conditions, uh, let's sit down, we'll, we'll read a story, whatever, we'll work together, with that group over there, that go, I will support you, come what may, I will work with you um, for the very best. So three definitions of, of love, um, which um, hopefully you uh, have seen and uh, exhibit yourselves. I don't want you to forget them though, because uh, especially as you go out into the world, especially as you go for job interviews, um, they're things you're gonna need to grapple with. Hang on to them, hang on to them. This is just a, a, a little quote from somebody that I found nothing to do with education uh, or, or nothing. He's not an educationist, but as a col columnist and a commentator, um, this is one thing that he said uh, <clears throat> about um, learning and, uh, and teaching. And particularly in the context of today and yesterday and last week and the white paper, um, it's, it rings true. There's a lot of reorganization at the moment going on, a lot of moving things around. Uh, by our friends at the Department for Education. And it would be very easy for me to stand up here and knock them and knock politicians. I'm not in the business uh, of wanting to do that, 
Um, but I do think uh, it's very important that you weigh things up and that you're critical, you're skeptical about things. And some of the things we talked about at the question time um, on Tuesday, it's important to hold on and think, well, what is going, what's the subtext here? And at the moment, there's a lot of reorganization going on. Local authorities fading away, um, schools becoming academies, uh, multi-academy trusts being formed. And David Brooks here is saying, this is tinkering at the edges, really. At the end of the day, people learn from those uh, that they um, love. Um, so, uh, what are the implications then for uh, how, how, how can we see this as in your work um, uh, as teachers? Well, partly I've talked about your own internal workings, the need to be passionate and, and, uh, and driven in the best sense of the word, um, the need to work together with other people for other people's benefit, and the need to be prepared to go the extra mile and be sacrificial. Um, can't help referring to the early years foundation stage, but if I use the early years foundation stage as um, and what happens in early years um, as examples of where we might see some of this working out. Um, uh, hopefully you can see it uh, in Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 as well. In the early years we talk about working uh, with the key person, the key person, and that's um, somebody like a teaching assistant, um, vital uh, to have a good relationship with them. Um, in the early years foundation stage, the key person, the concept of having the key person actually grew out of John Bowlby's research about attachment and uh, how important it was for children, especially very young children. Um, but you've seen it even in key stage two, I'm sure, where children um, in year five and year six and younger uh, form a special bond um, with teaching assistants. They're there as a support, but they're there as a friend um, um, as well. And um, uh, uh, Jules Page, who um, uh, is, is another person championing the use in academia of the word um, love, um, wrote this. She, she's written far more uh, than me, um, but um, I've, I've used her words here, because I think it's very important um, that when we talk about, particularly in um, early years, about um, the work of early childhood professionals and it being about caring and about educating. We talk about ECEC -E in the early childhood uh, education and care. There's a little bit more uh, if you throw in love uh, to that equation. Caring is, is one thing, um, but perhaps it doesn't um, have the emotional um, side of things um, that I'm talking about and that I think is very um, uh, special uh, and an important part of being um, a teacher. So Jules Page um, wrote this and other things and is quoted um, in this particular um, book uh, about the key person. So within a, relationships within your classroom, not just with children, but with adults, uh, it's very important. Um, I said I'd come back to um, self-esteem and feeling good about yourself and um, feeling confident um, in yourself and your identity. And um, uh, this is a quote um, regarding young children, um, and again, um, you can read it for yourselves. But we, in this country, don't handle young children um, as much as really, I think, it's necessary. Um, obviously, we have to be careful in schools uh, and settings. Um, because we don't want to be misunderstood, and there's no doubt about it, there are some um, awfully uh, uh, serious um, errors of judgment um, in schools um, and settings that have come to light. Um, however, we shouldn't, I believe, be put off unduly um, but, uh, from uh, touching and holding um, children um, particularly when they're in uh, a time of distress uh, and, and are anxious. Um, it, it's very important, especially for young children, that they feel um, confident with people, not just because you're smiling at them, not just because you're talking nicely to them and giving them praise, 
but because you're actually physically holding hands um, or you're actually physically with them um, in close proximity. I think that's very important and something that is open to misunderstanding, uh, open to abuse potentially. But I think the vast, vast majority um, of, of adults that work with young children and children in primary school um, need to be a little less um, rigid perhaps and a little bit more cuddly. Um, certainly when I've been overseas um, and worked in uh, preschools um, and volunteered in preschools um, in Eastern Europe, the children, the young children of three are climbing all over the male um, uh, uh, nursery teachers and it's seen as absolutely um, normal and um, very much part of um, a holistic and all-round um, education. Um, it nurtures self-esteem to feel wanted, to feel loved and that's uh, very important. But you know, the other important thing um, for you as teachers, um, I think, and in your teaching, is about um, looking after um, yourselves. And um, it's so easy, we hear so many stories today of people uh, burning out, not having a good work-life balance, etc., etc. I'm guilty myself. I, I, I find it very difficult. I think it's all part of uh, being uh, an educator and in that sort of field. But sometimes we have to uh, learn to cut um, ourselves off, not from people, but from sometimes from some of the work that, that crowds in and seems to dominate uh, what we're doing. Um, we, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, there are various categories, aren't there? Uh, there's marking children's work, um, there's uh, uh, marking stats papers, there's uh, handling data and providing that, which is all very necessary. I'm not saying don't do that um, as teachers. It's informative to a degree, but we need to look after ourselves and not um, uh, uh, and not overdo it. And this is where, if you like, we're going back to uh, this question of self-esteem and uh, self-identity um, earlier on. It's very, very important that we are confident in ourselves. Young children, when they have a good attachment, when they feel loved, when they feel valued, are um, uh, the most, um, not overconfident and arrogant uh, young people, but they're just secure. They're just secure. And that is the best place to start um, learning things, when you feel good about yourself, not stressed out, not anxious. Um, and providing a loving atmosphere and environment is good for young children, good for primary school children, but boy, is it good for yourself too. So I'm, what I'm saying here is uh, we need to nurture as teachers ourselves, feel good about what we're doing, not get weighed down by heavy workloads of doing things that are we think are necessary, but possibly uh, could be left to one side. Um, and not get weighed down with the negative publicity sometimes that surrounds us. I've got um, about 20 copies of an article here from an online journal, very easy reading. If you want one afterwards, come and uh, take one or take one and photocopy it. Um, but it's called How to Be a Happy Teacher. And um, uh, it, it puts into context some of the, um, some of the things that we need um, uh, to do and not do uh, when we're thinking about the profession. Um, it, it, it says, um, which is the bit I was going to read out, teaching is not a job where between nine and five your life is dictated by a list of predefined tasks to be completed in a prescribed manner. It's not. It might sometimes feel like that, but it's actually one of the most uh, 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 free jobs, despite all the things that come out um, uh, that we feel that we need to do and policies and procedures we need to follow. But it's not as restrictive as some people would have us make out. And it's not as restrictive as some jobs um, out there. It's different, especially the primary variety, um, this person goes on to say. It's huge. Children have to learn to read, write and do maths and science and all those other curriculum areas, of course. But our job is much bigger than that. Our job is so vast that no book has been written that will tell you how to do it. It's so complex, wait for it, 
that every teacher fails every day. That sounds awful, doesn't it? But actually, uh, it's true. You need to learn to live, uh, we need to learn to live uh, with failure uh, and not achieving everything, but at the same time realizing that we don't need to feel guilty about it. It is a fantastic um, vocation and profession, but there are all these things out there to help us. And I believe that actually um, tuning into uh, love in this way and keeping things into pers in perspective is um, one of the, uh, the best ways um, to uh, help us not to feel um, that we're actually unable to do it. So let's just go back to the children briefly before um, I start to wrap up. Um, applying it to um, this to your work with children, um, you know, loving knowledge, loving learning for learning's sake uh, is vital, is exciting. And yes, as that person said, we need to learn to teach this and to teach that. But ultimately, as WB Yates said, we've got to light the blue touch paper. And we're all born with that curiosity that that little baby had um, right at the beginning. We need to nurture it and keep that going. That's more important, I have to say, than actually reading, writing, uh, and arithmetic at the end of the day. And a number of us, uh, I know, have been talking in our seminar groups um, about these things. Um, it's important to keep that, um, keep that going. So always promote curiosity, uh, whether or not um, you're doing it because uh, a person you're, you're driven and motivated by that um, eros side of love, whether or not you're wanting to do it because you want the very best for that person to find out uh, things, to be able to become uh, that person that they uh, uh, are destined, if you like, um, to be whether you want it um, uh, for that, um, uh, based upon that idea of actually giving sacrificially for somebody else. Promote curiosity. It's hard sometimes, but actually um, it's what, it, it, it keeps the engine, it's what is the engine, if you like, to, uh, to all learning. Um, Roger Prentice, um, there's some references at the end here, um, wrote uh, this. And um, I can let you read that while I'm talking briefly. This picture is a little lad um, in the Czech Republic. Um, he was very curious when I was with him in a playground um, of a class of um, five-year-old children. And uh, I had a camera with me, and uh, he wanted uh, me to tell him what I was doing. And uh, he got so close to my lens, I couldn't resist taking a photo of him. He was so curious. Um, but Roger Prentice um, talks about um, uh, basically what we're uh, about um, education, about uh, that relationship um, with young children. Um, you get so much um, back from young children um, uh, if you love them. Um, so children again, isn't it funny? Um, here are some of the crazy things that they write to make it all worthwhile. Okay, I don't know where these came from, sorry, no reference. Um, but. Science, helicopters are cleverer than planes. Not only can they fly through the air, they can also hoover. Um, this one um, is a bit more risque, so you know, if you're bashful, cover your eyes now. <laughs> okay, so um, your assignment, your assignment, okay. Uh, five minutes, um, and then uh, I'll stop for some questions. Here's an old guy. Um, I like him. Um, some of you may know. Um, he was uh, writing in the 17th century um, and uh, uh, about all sorts of different things, um, but he wrote an awful lot about education as well as social uh, reform and so on and so forth. Actually, he lived in a part of the world that is now known as the Czech Republic, but actually most of his life he was exiled and had to live in Poland because there were lots of fighting going on um, and uh, he had to flee uh, the country. But um, this is uh, what I like um, about um, his view of, of learning, if you like. Um, the proper education of the young does not consist in stuffing their heads with a mass of words, sentences and ideas dragged together out of various authors, but in opening up their understanding to the outer world so that a living stream may flow from their minds, just as leaves, flowers and fruit 
spring from the bud um, on a tree. That's how I'd like to see education. That's how I'd like uh, to see, uh, and I did the best that I could. Hopefully, I'm still trying to do that um, with some of you uh, guys. But with young children, that's how I like to see uh, the process of education um, taking place. So here's the crux. Who should define the curriculum? Actually, I think I should. I don't mean that in the sense that I'm going to write a long curriculum, but I do mean it in the sense that through me, the curriculum is interpreted. I take the curriculum, whatever I have to teach, but ultimately, it comes through my values. It comes through what I believe to be important. It's filtered through me. I mediate, if you like, um, the curriculum. So I don't write it, but as a teacher working with children, I think you can be, in many senses, what we call, has been called the hidden curriculum in times gone by. The way that things are taught. Sure, there are facts and figures and the nuts and bolts, but actually who put those together, it's not all that important. Of course, there are things that need to be taught and there are some things that need to be taught in certain localities and parts of the country and perhaps not in others. But ultimately, the way things are taught um, come through the teacher. And I think uh, being informed by uh, a loving uh, approach to teaching and learning um, is the way that ultimately defines what um, children learn. Piaget, who you all, um, all know of, I'm sure, um, said this of Comenia, so maybe puts him a little bit more uh, into context um, for you. Education, according to the great man, is not merely the training of the child at school or in the home, it's a process affecting man and woman's whole life and the countless social adjustments um, he must make. So, as we finish, um, I'd like to play you a clip um, from a film that profoundly affected me, um, Dead Poets Society. Um, Keith, I know you'll have seen this film, but is, is there anybody else who's seen this? Oh, great. I'm delighted to hear that. I've got my copy down here. If anybody wants to borrow this, I'm very happy to lend it to you. Um, and uh, you'll have a great evening in with some friends. Um, and end up talking about your education studies assignment. Um, but for me, for me, um, I forget, I, I forgot his name. Robin Williams, thank you, um, Benji and James. Robin Williams sums up what, for me, teaching um, is all about, and the emphasis, what's important um, when he's talking. Um, ultimately to these uh, secondary school uh, boys at a public school in America, a private school, fee paying school in America, uh, that's very rigid, that's very predetermined. Um, and uh, you'll see what happens um, once the head of the, of the department comes in. And uh, after that, I think there's one more slide and we'll finish. Whoop. So hopefully. Gentlemen, open your text to page 21 of the introduction. Mr. Perry, will you read the opening paragraph of the preface entitled Understanding Poetry? Understanding Poetry by Dr. J. Evans Pritchard, PhD. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully has the objective of the poem been rendered? And two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. If the poem's score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph, and its importance is plotted on the vertical, then calculating the total area of the poem yields the measure of its greatness. A sonnet by Byron might score high on the vertical, but only average on the horizontal. A 
Shakespearean sonnet, on, on the other hand, would score high both horizontally and vertically, yielding a, a massive total area, thereby revealing the poem to be truly great. As you proceed through the poetry in this book, practice this rating method. As your ability to evaluate poems in this manner grows, so will, so will your enjoyment and understanding of poetry. Excrement. <laughs> That's what I think of Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not laying pipe, we're talking about poetry. How could you describe poetry like American bandstand? Well, I like fire and I give him a 42, but I can't dance to it. <laughs> now I want you to rip out that page. Go uh -huh. Rip out the entire page. Here, man. Rip it out. Rip it out! Go on. Rip it out! Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Gentlemen, tell you what, not just tear out that page, tear out the entire introduction. I want it gone. History, leave nothing of it. Rip it out! Rip! Be gone, J. Evan Pritchard, PhD. Rip! Shred! Tear! Rip it out! I want to hear nothing but ripping of Mr. Pritchard. We'll perforate it, put it on a roll. That's the Bible, you're not going to go to hell for this. Make a clean tear, I want nothing left of it. Rip it out, rip it! 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 Rip it out, I didn't know you were here. I am. Ah. Oh. So you are. Excuse me. Keep ripping, gentlemen. This is a battle. A war. And the casualties could be your hearts and souls. Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Armies of academics going forward measuring poetry. No! You'll not have that here. No more, Mr. J. Now, my class, you will learn to think for yourselves again. You will learn to savor words and language. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Now, see that look in Mr. Pitt's eye, like 19th century literature, has nothing to do with going to business school or medical school, right? Maybe. So, Hopkins, you may agree with them, thinking, yes, we should simply study our Mr. Pritchard and learn our rhyme and meter and go quietly about the business of achieving other ambitions. A little secret for you. Huddle up. Huddle up! We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race filled with passion. Medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. To quote from Whitman, O oh me, O oh life of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish. What good amid these, O oh me, O oh life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists and identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. That the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. your verse be. What will your verse be? How would you add uh, to what's gone before you? <laughs> 